Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, I have a, a lavalier mic, so I won't need this. Although with this mic, I'm tempted like Dr. Phil to wander through the crowd and really gather your attention, but no, it won't happen. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here and especially be bookend between uh, three of my favorite <coughs> public intellectuals in American life, Jay Budachewski, who was with you a few months ago, and then Robbie George and Gilbert Mylander. I highly recommend you're hearing Robert George from Princeton and Gilbert Mylander, two of the most important thinkers in America today, especially on these topics. And the topic of the proper relationship of Christians to politics or to religion and politics in general is urgent in our society today. <coughs> And there are a lot of people who need to be attending these lectures who don't go to Biola. I give you an example of two senators, one a Democrat, one a Republican, who I heard recently having lunch in Washington. And the Republican said to the Democrat, you know, the problem with you Democrats is that you don't really know any religious people. You don't know religious doctrine. You don't understand Christian history in American life. You don't even know any of them personally. In fact, I would actually bet you right now $20 that you can't even recite the Lord's Prayer. Whereupon the Democrat said, sure, I can do that. And so he said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Whereupon the Republican reached in his pocket, pulled out $20 and said, wow, I didn't think you could do it. <laughs> so education is needed even at the highest levels of our government life today. Um, <clears throat> In this talk, I, I want to highlight and argue that, uh, several things. Uh, after over a half century uh, in eclipse, the worldview of conservative evangelical Christians has regained political and cultural significance in American life. And in, in this presentation, I want to trace the complex theological, cultural, and political trends that led first to the eclipse of conservative evangelicals and fundamentalists, but also suggest the reasons for their remarkable resurgence that has been mounted by Christian evangelicals and fundamentalists. Now at the outset, I'd also like to say that I will often use the terms evangelicals and fundamentalist Christians interchangeably. Here's why. Uh, to help explain the more militant and dogmatic style of Christian fundamentalists in American life, our leading scholar of American fundamentalists is a man named George Marsden, a historian recently retired at Notre Dame, George Marston described the differences between evangelicals and fundamentalists this way. He said, a fundamentalist Christian is an evangelical who is mad about something. A fundamentalist is an evangelical who is mad. And what he is commenting on there is a certain rigid, militant style of presenting himself in public life. Or there is the historian at Duke Divinity School, Grant Wacker, who said, an evangelical Christian is somebody who really, really likes Billy Graham. A fundamentalist is somebody who thinks Billy Graham is a liberal. <laughs> now, for those of you too young to know Billy Graham, uh, this is laughable, and that's why I told you. Uh, but oftentimes, what we're talking about when we talk about evangelicals and fundamentalists is an emphasis on style, on presentation. Uh, but I use them interchangeably because when it comes to politics, our national media doesn't know the difference and doesn't care. They see them all as the same. And while we can have our intramural disputes about, wait a minute, don't call me a fundy, uh, the national media thinks you are, no matter what. And if they say, don't call me an evangelical, I'm really a fundamentalist, well, they, they don't know the difference. So I'm using it as a blanket term for people who take the Apostles' Creed seriously. How's that? Now, uh, the historian at John Hopkins University named Timothy Smith once described American evangelicals as being like a mosaic or even a kaleidoscope because evangelicals include not only a diversity of denominations but also Christians from the political right, the left, and the center. Evangelicals are by no means monolithic in their political views. While they've largely maintained an alliance with political conservatism, they do have a moderate and liberal and left-wing contingent. Almost 20 years ago, in a cover story in the very important literary magazine called The Atlantic Monthly, a Harvard theologian, Harvey Cox, spent a semester visiting Pat Robertson's Regent University in Virginia. And Professor Cox wrote a cover story in The Atlantic where he said he was surprised to find that conservative Christians at Regent University in Virginia were not monolithic in their political views, 
In fact, he found that while fundamentalists, evangelicals, and charismatic Christians were often lumped, lumped together in the press, he said they in fact represent distinct tendencies that are fundamentally at odds with one another. Now, Harvey Cox from Harvard is not unlike many observers outside the evangelical movement who are often surprised when they discover just how diverse evangelical intellectual opinions are on political and social issues. But American evangelical Protestants have often held conflicting views theologically when it comes to their relationship to American culture and American politics. An old and favored hymn of many evangelical Christians begins this way. It says, and I quote, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't find, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. End of, end of him. Many American evangelicals have often seen themselves as faithful band of believers in a world that is clearly headed for destruction. Which is to say that their utter worldliness was always undergirded by a theological perspective that featured an apocalyptic understanding of where history was going and also included a, included a deep sense that they, therefore, were called to be a loyal remnant community of Christian believers whose main task was to warn others of the wrath that is to come. <clears throat> and so they would issue invitation to others to join the spiritual minority whose treasures are stored up in a place where, raw, where moth and rust never can corrupt. This caused many evangelicals and fundamentalists to perceive themselves as a cognitive and religious minority in a land that was surely on its way to ruin. This theological perspective recalls the view of the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody regarding his task in the world. Moody said, the world is like a giant ship, but it's a sinking ship. And Moody said, and I quote, the gospel is like a life preserver. And God has said to me, Moody, save as many as you can before the entire ship sinks. And so Moody said that God had given him life preservers and he was throwing them overboard to save drowning people. And his lack of concern for social and political issues were simply this. Why waste your time cleaning up a sinking ship? The world is going to hell. Why spend any time fixing up moral, political, and cultural issues? But American evangelicals are also heirs to a spiritual legacy of Puritanism. And many of them have inherited, have inherited a Puritan conception of America as a chosen nation. A nation with the soul of a church, as G.K. Chesterton described it. This idea that America has a special divine relationship with God's purposes among all nations has been buried very deeply in the collective psyche of many branches of evangelicalism. In this view, America is seen as a city upon a hill and is also seen as a light to all the nations. These, seen, these themes can be seen in the words of the patriotic song, America the Beautiful, where it says, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to signing she. See, so <clears throat> we see then that within American evangelicalism, there are at least, and maybe more, but at least two different political theologies, if you will, that lie deep within the evangelical consciousness. One is a holy remnant apocalypticism, and another a chosen nation theme, and a sort of triumphalism. And many evangelicals often vacillate between these two patterns of thinking as it befits their mood, but also as it fits their standing in the current cultural climate. A loyal remnant or a chosen nation. And we see these themes repeat themselves in American history. Much of even American evangelicalism, especially its fundamentalist wing, had been stuck in a comfortable, had been stuck in a comfortable politically passive otherworldliness up until the mid-1970s in our country. They are comfortable with setting up their own private Christian schools, their own Bible colleges, their own Christian colleges, Christian magazines, and very large parachurch organizations, along with very expansive radio and TV networks that reach millions and millions of listeners and viewers. They lived in a parallel culture, a parallel culture to the wider culture. But just over 35 years ago, the potential powerful political influence of millions of conservative evangelicals in America was little known and unacknowledged in American life. But all of that changed in 1976. At a conference I hosted in 1990 with academics and Christian leaders on the rise of the Christian right in American politics, the Reverend Ed Dobson, a former assistant to the Reverend Jerry Falwell, a founder of the Christian right, 
said that Reverend Falwell realized how much potential there was to influence the political process when in the summer of 1976, when on his national television pr uh, program in his Sunday service, he criticized then presidential, Carter, presidential candidate Jimmy Carter for having given an interview to, of all places, Playboy magazine. Well, much to his surprise, Falwell the very next day received a call from President Carter's special assistant, Jody Powell, asking him that he please refrain from making such comments about candidate Carter. Back off, Jody Powell said. Falwell was so utterly startled that anything he would say would be of such interest to a presidential campaign that Ed Dobson said he came to perceive this as his initial baptism into the world of American politics. So I say to liberal groups when I speak to them, if you're upset with the rise of the millions of people in the Christian right who are involved in politics, blame it on Jody Powell for calling Jerry Falwell. He should have left it alone. Now many members of the evangelical Christian right had similar experiences on a personal level, which left them obligated to become politically involved, something, as I've said, they had not been inclined to do previously, largely for theological reasons. Their emergence on the political scene in the late 1970s caught many journalists and public policy experts by surprise. But increasing pressures from a number of factors in the larger culture caused evangelical leaders to feel, as a sociologist from Scotland, Stephen Bruce has said in his really terrific book called The Rise and Fall of the New Christian Right. He said they were not getting their due and their due could be gotten if they organized to claim it and organized they did. Their effective use of television and direct mail, the declining memberships of liberal denominations and the increasing numbers within evangelical churches and denominations gave them rising confidence and combined to make political involvement appear to be a promising and worthwhile endeavor. What stirred them most was a sense that various Supreme Court decisions were giving increasing power to the opponents of Christian values. They became what the Harvard professor Nathan Glazer has called a defensive offensive. A defensive offensive against what they saw as an aggressive imposition of secular views on American society, including their own private communities of faith. And so they felt pushed into action against what they perceived as an aggressive imposition by secular forces bent on disrupting their enclaves of traditionally conservative Protestant faith. In due course, religious conservatives began to be accused of imposing their views and forcing their beliefs on the rest of American society. But I ask, was this really the case? Listen to Nathan Glazer, a social scientist at Harvard, who said this in 1982, and I quote, abortion was not a national issue in our country until in 1973, the Supreme Court set national standards for state laws. It did not become an issue because evangelicals and fundamentalists wanted to strengthen prohibitions against abortion, but because liberals wanted to abolish all prohibitions. Pornography in the 1980s did not become an issue because evangelicals and fundamentalists wanted to ban D.H. Lawrence or James Joyce or even Henry Miller, but because in the 1960s and 1970s, under the table, pornography moved to the top of our newsstands. And prayer in the schools did not become an issue because evangelicals wanted to introduce new prayers, but because the Supreme Court ruled against all prayers. So again, end of quote, uh, this imposition of a liberal and progressive ethos by what many social scientists have called the new class elites. The new class elites are uh, made up of newspaper journalists, television producers, and commentators and the knowledge class from the universities. It's what aroused many previously apolitical and socially indifferent evangelicals to political action. Now, while many evangelicals have always found plenty to complain about in the wider culture, the rapid changes in American society, society during the 60s and 70s, uh, the ones that your parents grew up in, sent shockwaves through their community. Sociologist Steve Bruce had said this, conservative Protestants in the 1950s were offended by women smoking in public. By the late 1960s, women were to be seen on news film dancing naked at open air rock concerts. In other words, the culture had shifted and changed. In short, the era of Eisenhower's, Amer Eisenhower's America was far different than the America of the 60s and 70s. And by the 1950s and the 1960s, the Supreme Court and Congress were imposing cosmopolitan values on the South. In 1976, there were 77 federal regulatory bodies and 50 of them had been created since 1960. At the same time, the distinctness of regional culture had been threatened by the growth of national corporations. 
Putting it simply, the Bible Belt had been penetrated by cosmopolitan culture. Or as the political analyst Kevin Phillips says it, he says the worlds of Manhattan, Harvard and Beverly Hills were being exported to Calhoun County, Alabama, and Calhoun County did not like it. They did not like it. So when one talks to those involved in the politics of the Christian right, as I have, you begin to notice that they feel like they're living in an alien environment, which is radically different from the world in which they grew up and in which their parents grew up. They feel that the cultural liberalization and the cultural pluralism of American society are undermining their schools and their homes. And time and again, Christian conservatives describe the same epiphany, the day they realized that the schools, the public schools, were not teaching with them, but against them. Sometimes the epiphany is not about the schools, but about some other arm of the government, but the epiphany, epiphany is always an undermining, they feel, of the home. Now, there's still many political pundits and observers who believe that Christian conservatives represent a mass movement of cultural dinosaurs with religious views akin to what the Baltimore journalist H.L. Meekin said in 1925 in Discovering Fundamentalist. He called them people who had a childish theology for half-wits, yokels, the anthropoid rabble, and the gaping primates of, primates of the upland valleys. That's what he said. And the Washington Post, while not as colorful as Minkin in 1972, said these people are poor, uneducated, and easy to command. Well, to the bewilderment of many, the poor, uneducated, and easy to command gaping primates from the Upland Valley are still very much with us, and they become a very large voting block. H.L. Minkin, the journalist I just mentioned in 1924, said this, and I quote, you heave an egg out a Pullman train window and you'll hit a fundamentalist Christian almost anywhere in the United States today. And if Minkin were living today, he might put a different spin on it. He might say, heave an egg out a window anywhere on Capitol Hill and you'll be likely hit an evangelical political activist. And while that activism is most likely to be conservative politically, he or she may be just as mad at the Republican Party as they are the Democratic Party. <clears throat> as I have suggested earlier, for several decades in this century, from roughly 1925 until the end of World War II, a large sector of conservative Protestant social thought was influenced by a pessimistic form of premillennial pre eschatology and a pietistic individualism that looked with disdain on any effort to improve social condi conditions or political structures. A certain form of premillennial eschatology holds that conditions of the world morally, culturally, and socially will continue only to get worse and worse until finally the return of Christ and the second coming will bring the restoration of the world. So there are many Christians who had originally believed that, that the process of decline and secularization was simply irreversible, and this pessimism was reinforced by this eschatology, which had always believed that the end times were just around the corner. This kind of eschatology leads to a pessimistic view of human progress, and these people felt strongly that terrible times were soon des des uh, descending upon the world and only the second coming of Christ would redeem humanity and restore creation. This is why I call the founder of the Christian right, Jerry Falwell, a paradoxical premillennialist because he believed that through his work with the moral, he believed in his work in the moral majority would improve political and social conditions, but his theology said things would only ultimately get worse. So he was a paradoxical, paradoxical premillennialist. He knew they were gonna get worse, but he was gonna do everything he can to try to keep it from getting worse. But this view had not always been the view of previous Protestant leaders. The historian Winthrop uh, Hudson wrote in, 19, in 1900 that few would have disputed the contention. The United States was a Protestant nation. So self-evident was the fact that its life and its culture had been shaped by three centuries of Protestant witness and influence. Up until the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925, where a biology teacher named John Scopes challenged the Tennessee law that banned the teaching of Darwinism, conservative Protestants had aggressively addressed almost every major and social political issue in American public life. But at the Scopes trial in 1925, William Jennings Bryant defended the Texas Tennessee law and he won the argument. I mean, he won the case. But his performance against the HCO lawyer Clarence Darrow was so embarrassing and so bad that it was ridiculed in the press and he and fundamentalism lost in the court of public opinion. As a historian George Marsden has pointed out, this made it increasingly difficult 
for conservative Protestants to be taken seriously, and it calls many evangelicals and fundamentalist Christians to retreat from society and from politics. Marsden points out, and I quote, within the span of one generation, between the 1890s and the 1930s, the extraordinary influence of evangelicalism in the public sphere of American culture simply collapsed. Not only did the cultural opinion makers desert evangelicalism, even major leaders, even many leaders of major Protestant denominations attempted to tone down the, the offenses to modern sensibilities of a Bible filled with miracles and a gospel proclaiming human salvation through Christ's atoning work on the cross. That's the end of quote. Now the preeminence of this conservative Protestant Christianity was challenged from all sides, and theological liberalism was in fact at that time growing in influence as it attempted to accommodate modern scientific thought with its theology. And something very important called the fundamentalist modernist controversy led to radically different understandings of the Christian message of salvation and the authority of scripture. These disputes led to opposing views concerning Christian proper Christian response to social action and political activity. As theological modernists began to interpret the entire Christian message in terms of its social implications, evangelicals abandoned social concern altogether. The fundamentalist William Bell Riley labeled liberal understandings of the gospel as a form of what he called social service Christianity. Now this kind of fundamentalism, however, was challenged in the 1940s by a number of more moderate evangelicals who began to question the militant and confrontational style of fundamentalists. And in 1947, a very important evangelical theologian named Carl Henry published a book called The Uneasy Conscious of Modern Fundamentalism, and it had a huge influence and impact. According to Carl Henry, the theological separatism of fundamentalism led to a separation from culture and from politics and from social responsibility and to a mistaken disengagement from the important issues of the day. This backlash reaction to the social gospel had created almost a complete avoidance of social programs altogether. This divorce between a Christian proclamation and Christian compassion, Carl Henry argued, was an abandonment of the clear teachings of scripture and church history. And so he condemned it with the, this tragic development in the strongest terms and he pointed out that, and I quote, fundamentalism is revolting, and revolting against the social gospel seemed also to revolt against the Christian social imperative. Now, making connection between faith and politics at that time was quite novel, and Carl Henry and other evangelical leaders had their persistent critics on their right, but critics also formed after the 1960s on their left with a younger group of evangelicals called radical evangelicals who formed a coalition on the evangelical left. But as I suggested earlier, growing opposition that had enormous impact and influence in the late 1970s was the rise of the Christian right. The rise of the moral majority and the Christian coalition and the ministries like Focus on the Family had great influence in the decades of the 1980s. They were credited with lending enormous support to Ronald Reagan to dozen Senate races in 1980. And up until this day, they provide a large support for Republican candidates on the state and national level. However, with the deaths of Derek Jerry Falwell and a Presbyterian minister named D. James Kennedy and the waning power of James Dobson and Pat Robertson, they're, they have diminished in their influence. Moreover, dramatic shifts in the wider culture concerning hot button issues like gay marriage and abortion has called many of the current leadership of conservative Christians to admit that they no longer represent the moral majority in American life today, but more and more they confess with great reluctance that they represent the moral minority. <clears throat> so in light of this, it's hard to predict what the future holds for Christian conservatives involved in politics. But in light of that also, I would like to put forward four propositions about what we ought to at least do between our time now and the future going forward. In the past 20 years, experienced observers on the political right and the left have made very striking claims regarding the state of our culture and our politics and the role that Christians should play. In the late 1990s, during the impeachment crisis of President Clinton, a founder of the Christian right, a man named Paul Weirich, the late Paul Weirich, wrote an open letter to leading religious and cultural conservatives, and he said this, and I quote, because of the impeachment crisis of President Clinton and, how, and because the country actually didn't want President Clinton to be impeached, he was despondent, and he wrote, we are caught up in the cultural collapse of historical proportions, a collapse so great it simply overwhelms our politics. <clears throat> I think, in fact, Professor Kennedy, you were in Washington when this letter went out and everybody was talking about it. 
He called for disengagement away from politics because America was descending in what he called something approaching barbarism. People of faith, he said, should adopt a strategy of separation because we need some sort of quarantine from the larger culture. Now think of this a moment. A leading founder of the moral majority said, give up on politics. It's of no use. But then, fast forward just five years later after Weirich's letter, soon after the election of George W. Bush in 2000, a host of commentators and scholars wrote books and essays warning that America was on the verge of a theocracy, of becoming a theocracy. People like Kevin Phillips and James Root and Michelle Goldberg and Randall Balmer wrote best-selling books that argued that the fear of theocracy had become the defining pattern of liberalism in the Bush era. In fact, in the pages of the New York Times Magazine, the respected classic scholars Gary Wills all but announced the end of the Enlightenment, fearing that religious jihad had arrived in America led by Southern Baptists. Many of those who read these predictions took them so seriously, and I'm not joking when I say this, they took them so seriously they began plotting their move and escape to Canada. Remember Baldwin was going to Canada. If George Bush gets elected again, I'm moving to Canada. We still wait for him to move. Please, sir, move soon. <laughs> well, in light of their panic, theocratic panic of George Bush, what happens next? The, re the election and the re-election of President Obama. So much for a theocracy. So much for the Christian right taking over. So much for the end of the Enlightenment. Well, in some ways it still is. Uh, but now we have new prediction from conservative Christian leaders right after the re-election of President Obama. According to the, Southern, the prolific Southern Baptist theologian Albert Moeller, Al Moeller said, quote, a catastrophe, we are now in the middle of a catastrophe of crucial moral concerns. Christian conservative activists may pronounce us that we have lost the culture. In fact, one TV commentator at the Christian Broadcasting Network said, this election was a disaster. No, in fact, it was a colossal disaster. Some astute observers said that the conservative moral values, voter values now face the very real possibility that their core concerns no longer resonate with the majority of American people. But an insightful public intellectual named Irving Kristol said to me in Washington 20 years ago, he said, Michael, there's not a culture war in America today. There was one, but it's over. The other side won. The other side won. He was echoing the views of his wife, who was a great historian named Gertrude Hemmefarb, and she wrote a very important book called One Nation, Two Cultures, a book, by the way, I warmly commend to the professors here at Biola University to give to their students to read. One Nation, Two Cultures. Wherein she argued that we're suffering from six things in American life today. Number one, the collapse of ethical principles and habits in American life. Number two, the loss of respect for authorities and institutions. Number three, the very breakdown of the family. Number four, the decline of civility. Number five, the vulgarization of high culture. And number six, the degradation of popular culture. Now Irving Kristol and Gertrude Hemmefar both would have thought that all these laments about the state of our culture today were more than a little late since these cultural trends had been in motion for a very, very long time. And so in my opinion, the Kristols have been much wiser and closer to the truth on these matters. But I also suspect there's even a deeper dimension to, the, to be explored here if we were to understand these things properly as Christians. Perhaps our mistake is in assuming that we ever had the culture and that we lost the culture. Perhaps we misunderstand the relationship of the Christian faith to our culture when we do that. For me, the best guide for us in rethinking that relationship in these challenging days and ahead is the great St. Augustine. Indeed, I will argue in what follows that we need to cultivate what I call an Augustinian sensibility if we're to rightly discern what we as Christians should and should not aspire to do as Christians in the public square at all times. In the, in the classic city of God, Augustine makes a very radical claim. He says, the city of man, which means the current world and culture, the city of man is always at odds with the city of God. Because we presently live between these two cities, we can never really claim to ever have won the culture. That understanding, that commitment to the future city of God should always be operating in the background, 
in the background of our minds as we go about being faithful citizens in this broken world and doing the best we can with the broken instruments that we have to work with. As I will argue in a moment, this does not mean that we cease to love and to care for this earthly city and for the welfare of our fellow image bearers. I am only suggesting that this Augustinian view will give us a realistic approach to the problems of politics and the state of our culture. <clears throat> in Jeremiah 27, the prophet Jeremiah says, we are to build houses and to plant gardens, and we are to, quote, seek the welfare of the city while living in exile. For in its exile, you will, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Again, Jeremiah 29 says, seek the welfare of the city while living in exile, for in its welfare, you will find our welfare. Because we are, to do, we are to do what we've always been commanded to do, which is to seek justice and love mercy and care for the least of these and to love our neighbors. And one important form of neighbor love is to work for justice in the political arena. The late father Richard John Newhouse put it best this way when he said, it is our duty to strive to build a world in which the strong are just and power is tempered by mercy, in which the weak are nurtured and the marginal embraced, and to see to it that those at the entrance gates and those at the exit gates of life are protected, both by law and by love. Let me give you that quote again. It's very important. Father Newhouse said, we are to strive to build a world in which the strong are just, power is tempered by mercy, in which the weak are nurtured and the marginal people embraced, and to see to it that those at the entrance gates and those at the exit gates of life are protected by law and by love. That covers just about everybody. <clears throat> so tonight I'd like to propose four propositions we should keep in mind as we look forward to the future. Proposition number one, please remember, words matter. Words matter. What we say in public matters. Being a person who speaks in a civil tone in a civil manner is a virtue. Christians who are concerned about politics be, need to be reminded daily. Practic practicing civility is a virtue. And so I would say, perhaps I don't need to say it to you, but I do say it in Washington, to all the high-strung activists on both the political right and left, I would remind you that being civil is not a cop-out in order to trim one's convictions. Civility is not a wimp word. Being decent and kind is not a wimp out. The American religious historian Mark Marty said it best this way. He said, people who are civil often lack convictions, and people with strong convictions often lack civility. What we need today are people who have convicted civility. Convictions with good manners. Convictions with civility. There's far too little of it in Washington today. Now, it is true that some people feel that civility is a virtue prized by those who are uncertain about everything. But this does not have to be the case. One does not have to be evasive to be a civil and decent person. In fact, civility is not just a matter of good manners and pulling our punches. It is instead a matter of showing fundamental respect and decency for people we are engaging in the public arena. In order to be persuasive, even with firmly held convictions, we must resist the temptation to respond in a motive fashion, but instead in ways that are winsome and appealing. Now, why do I emphasize this? Because I could give you illustrations of people in the evangelical community who are not taken seriously today because of their tone of voice, their words, their very body language. The blood vessels in their neck are protruding they're so upset, so concerned about the collapse of civilization that's just coming around the next election. They need an Augustinian sensibility, it is, and they need civility. It is, it is quite simply the will of God, it is the will of God that we not kill each other about our differences about the will of God. Now that may be obvious to you, but when you work in Washington, <laughs> the word chill comes to mind a lot. Dude, chill, chill. This is not in our, we're trying to be faithful citizens, but ultimately it's not on us. I've said chill a lot recently to people. You may have heard the term. Proposition number two. We need to encourage an evangelical understanding of what St. Thomas Aquinas called the most important of all the four, four cardinal virtues, 
That is the virtue of prudence. St. Thomas said, without prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance cannot be even achieved. Prudence is the perfected ability to make right decisions. I repeat, being a prudent person means you have perfected the ability to make wise and right decisions. Prudence is defined as practical wisdom. It is the process of moral reasoning by which our ideals are approximated to the contours of a very, very broken and imperfect world. A prudent person asks, what are the ends we seek? And then they balance and weigh the ends. And this balancing process may require that we reduce the scope of some of our ends. The prudent person is not an ideologue of the right or the left. And as a result, is always open to new facts, new information, willing to adjust their views according to new reality. Prudent Christians are realists who understand that our ideals must be approximated because we live in a fallen and imperfect world. And the prudent person realizes that the drawing of relative moral distinctions is a Christian political responsibility, and a prudent person is prepared, therefore, to make imperfect choices between alternatives that are clearly not the best options available. I mean, they're not the best options that you would want, but they are what's available. So therefore, I say that we should encourage an existential and epistemological humili humility before the naughty complexities that our political problems keep sending our way. Learning to be prudent is vitally important because the realm of, the po realm of politics is the world oftentimes of uncertain and relative choices. It is often fraught with ambiguity. There will always be, and I can give examples in the Q&A of such ambiguity. There will always be times that we hoped, there will always be things that we hoped for and things that we wish might have been. But being prudent means that we learn how to balance competing goods against lesser evils and keeping a sharp sense of the many ambiguities there at the heart of the political process. What I'm simply saying is that ambiguity is not bad and that we can learn to be wise. And some people like everything to be black and white and they come to Washington and they're surprised because it's not that way. So in light of that, proposition number three is this. We need to recover, and you probably heard it from your professors and you'll hear it again tonight. We need to recover an appreciation of the Christian natural law position, uh, tradition. I know you'll hear it from Robbie George because he's one of the leading thinkers of it in America today. Given that we live in a pluralistic society, we need to develop a public language that will appeal across different traditions and different worldviews. On a pragmatic and practical level, our work will require us to learn ways to make common calls with fellow citizens who do not share our exact theological presuppositions. Concerns for international human rights, for example, are issues of concern to people from every imaginable religious and non-religious tradition. And so we will find ourselves working alongside them and building coalitions with them. Given that many of these issues cut across religious and ideological and political commitments, we therefore need to develop what I call a public language, a public grammar, a public theology that will allow us to speak I like to say in a bilingual fashion, a bilingual fashion. In this way, we'll begin to develop points of contact with our fellow concerned citizens who don't share our theology, but do share our common concern about an issue. Now, I could spend the rest of the evening talking about this in dialogue, but you understand my point, I hope. The natural law tradition argues that people of all races and all cultures and all religions have access to a universal law through their natural reason Natural law provides an ethical moral framework that all persons can grasp without the, divine, without the aid of special and divine revelation. Without the aid, they can still get the point that murder is wrong. You don't have to be a believer to believe certain things. C.S. Lewis argues that without divine revelation, you can still say if you're in a war zone and your fellow soldier runs like a coward, that you say, there goes a coward. You don't run away in battle. It's wrong, and you don't have to be a believer to see it. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, natural law can therefore provide us a public grammar for making appeals in the public arena of people who hold different presuppositions than we do. That's all I'm saying. And so it provides a bridge between the sacred and secular world, and therefore provides a vocabulary for the believer and unbeliever alike. What I'm suggesting is simply uttering the words, thus saith the Lord, will not do when trying to speak to a diverse public who've never heard the phrase before. They don't even know what, what Lord are you talking about? In other words, I bet as Jay Budaszewski probably said to you when he was here 
There is a law written on every human heart and we can find ways when working for justice to make appeals to all people, believers and unbelievers alike. Learning the, Latin, the language of natural law will do much to help us master two grammars, one for when we are addressing fellow believers and one when we're speaking to the larger public about our common concerns. <clears throat> now, proposition number four, and racing toward a conclusion. Finally, I think it's important for all of us who work, who, who aspire to work in this arena, that we learn to develop what I like to call an Augustinian sensibility as we go about our work. And here's what I simply mean. While affirming our responsibilities and obligations, as I said earlier to the city of man, we need to remember that our true home is in the city of God, which is to come. So while living in this earthly city, we're to pursue temporal goals and to pursue justice, but always doing so with a keen sense that we are, uh, of who we are, and a wariness of the fragile character of our earthly commitments and our alliances. We would do well to be reminded that in this world filled with profound suffering and terrible disorders, we can strive to maintain and create an order that approximates justice and to work fervently to prevent the very worst from happening. One of the most difficult concepts for religiously motivated Christian political and social act activists to grasp on the political right and the political left are four words, now but not yet. Now but not yet. We're not there yet. We're here now, but the kingdom has not come yet. And learning that, that the kingdom of God has entered this age, but the final kingdom has not come yet, keeping this in mind is very important as we go about our business of being faithful Christian citizens and having an Augustinian sensibility will give us a spiritual and emotional balance and perspective as we remind ourselves constantly that we live at the intersection of the ages between the city of man and the city of God that is to come. So in conclusion, politics is, as the German sociologist Max Weber once said, politics is the strong and slow boring of very hard boards. Think of the concept. Politics is the strong and slow boring of very hard boards. It takes passion and perspective. Working for justice in our fallen world requires patience and persistence, prudent and principled compromise, because it is the art of the possible and is not the reign of the saints, you may have noticed. Over time, one learns that through the hard knocks of battles fault, some victories won, but many disappointments beyond measure. The politics is, as the theologian Ron Honeiber put it, and I quote, the method of finding approximate solutions to basically insoluble problems. Let me say that again. Politics is the method of finding approximate solutions to basically insoluble problems. In this earthly city, we have our duties and we have our obligations. But it is important that we remember we will always be caught between what we fervently desire and the real world possibilities, which are always less than our utopian dreams. This will cause us, I believe, to be Christian realists, but never to be Christian cynics. We're to be Christian realists, but not cynics. We will realize that in this life, there will never be a return to paradise, never utopia, and there will never ever be an end to, to all our friction and our strife. Therefore, we should not be surprised when issues that we care about turn out to be more complicated than we ever imagined. This in turn will cause us to have a chastened view of politics. Because we live between the intersection of the two cities, there will be no final victories, but no final defeats. No final victories, but no final defeats. And so we press on to be faithful, but always without illusions in this earthly city, waiting with hopeful expectation for the city that is to come. So during this time of transmission, transition, during this time of transmission, this time of transmission is really the very nature of our earthly existence. We are always, always in a time of transition. This is what we're in. So we must do our duties while living in exile, confident that the final consummation of history and true justice will come with the restoration of the entire universe to its created glory. Thank you very much. I am more than willing to entertain questions. That's when I really get going.
Are there any questions that were so profoundly clear to all of you? Now, look, I know it's true. You are here, most of you, because you're going to get extra credit. And you came and you thought, politics? I live in California. <laughs> politics? Here comes that question. I knew if I delayed. Yes, sir. To what degree um, should we, as college students, with a particular, particular focus at this time in our lives, and Absolutely. busy schedules and whatnot, um, what should we often be concerned about politics, about being informed, about being involved in those discussions and voting and things like that? I know for me, I feel like I don't know anything. I feel like I don't know know better about politics, about, you know, what the issues are and what to think about them. And Thank you. You're right. Take the time to, you know. Tell me your name. Derek. Derek. I have several kids in college, and they look at me and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> I just spoke in Chattanooga last week, and I gave a similar but different talk, and two of my kids came, and they'd never heard me speak in public life before. <laughs> and. They didn't know what I thought about this stuff. I mean, I mean they're on their iPhones. It was dinner, they were worried about their girlfriends and their boyfriends. Anyway, um, your question is extremely relevant. And let me just quickly say that I will say, as a person who works in public policy in Washington, D.C., that politics ain't everything. Thank God. <laughs> and that if you have a vocation outside of the political, you have a really important vocation. And I, I hold to a reformed Christian view of work and calling that there's no such thing as mundane work. All work is sacred, and what your calling is, and why, the reason I'm emphasizing this is that I know so many people who work in Washington who come here and say, the most important thing that's going on in Washington right now. No, the most important thing going on right now might be in your dorm and the way you treat your roommate or your friends. And I've been told by people when I've gone off to speak in chapel at Christian colleges, oh, go tell them about what's going on in Sudan. And be sure to tell them about hunger in Africa. And, be, and I went down to a, a college in Tennessee and I said, I was just told to tell you to head off to Sudan, but I'm telling you to go clean up your room and, and love your neighbor. <laughs> and by the way, return your parents' phone calls. <laughs> and thank them. So uh, my point, Derek, is that, uh, uh, it, look, it'll catch up with you. You know why? You're gonna have to start paying taxes. <laughs> And you're going to say, where did all this money go? And what do I need to give to them? And what are they doing with it? And I mean that humorously, and I mean it seriously. Uh, but I also want to say that right now, your calling is to be a student at Biola University and to be a good one. And so uh, anybody that comes into here from out of town, no matter if your professor has urged them to do so, uh, and said, you know, all the most important things that are going on are going on in Washington. Tell them, well, we had a guy here from Washington who said, that's not true. And that would be me, because, uh, again, now, I, look, I believe this stuff is true. I think as Christians, we have obligations to love our neighbor, and one of the implications of neighbor love is to care about the shape of our public life. And if your neighbor's being crushed by the political system, we need to try to change that. So as you grow out of Biola, and no matter what your major is or what your job is, you will then begin to ask these questions, well, wait a minute, what are we doing with our foreign policy over there? Or why are we not over there? And then all these questions will start coming. And so when they come three or four or five years from now, I want you to send me an email and say they came. And I'm ready to hear your talk again. I'll come back to Biola and the students can hear it. You can come sit in the back. But you understand my point then therefore is I do want anybody to leave here saying, you know, I'm not really into politics and uh, it doesn't really matter to me, but I have to take this class. Uh, you know, don't feel bad about it. I mean, look, I, I went to college and my major was psychology. I was a psychology major. I've been involved in public policy for over 30 years. And I wasn't on my way to a public policy think tank. And so you may be surprised the way God changes things in your life, and so you want to be ready. So I, I hope I haven't, uh, maybe some people in the room want me to say, I'll tell them all to go major in political science, but I don't think so. But in light of all our callings, the political is important. And we, if, you're, if you're called to be a lawyer and to go into the legal world, you're going to run into political questions. You're going to ask questions about city hall and about your mayor. You're going to get involved in politics. That's a long answer. Yes, Matt. Michael, just, just fast forward 10 or 20 years. Uh, I guess that's where I am. But for these folks who 
approach too. If you had to take two things that every Christian who's an American should do to be politically engaged, what would you tell them? Just a couple things. Just basic building blocks of political engagement for citizens. Oh, yes. Uh, first, they should go major in political science at Biola University. <laughs> Amen, Scott? Um, <clears throat> no, I think, uh, I think that uh, as, as you uh, leave college and get married and have children and move out into life, you begin running into, you, you cannot avoid running into political questions. And as the whole question of the future of the definition of marriage becomes a part of our vocabulary, you're not going to be able to avoid, and I know it's a controversial question, not even in the larger, wider culture, but even at Christian colleges, uh, these questions of the political are going to come up. And so, uh, I mean, you know, I could say, well, everybody ought to get involved in your local county and precinct stuff, and I, I'm not going to say that, but I, I, I'm just going to say that, uh, you know, I found myself growing in turn about politics when I got involved in a prison ministry and I saw the way prisoners were being mistreated in our criminal justice system and I worked for an ex-prisoner who was one time worked in the White House named Charles Colson and as I was involved in prison fellowship I began asking questions related to well wait a minute uh, our justice system shows preference for who and why and then you began asking questions about the justice or unjustness of legal systems and so Instead of, Matt, for me just saying, you know, go, go do this, I, I think that being aware of current events and staying up to date with what America's role in the world is and, and uh, how tax policy is shaping California's awful budget might cause you to say, you know, we need more responsible people in office and I want to do what I can to get involved. So I don't want to lay out any sort of grandiose become the next William Wilberforce type of scenario. Uh, I know that some people go speak on Christian college campuses and they talk about the wonderful Christian hero we have that abolished the slave trade named William Wilberforce. And they get inspired and they come rushing to Washington and they become an intern of mine and they want to change the world and I just need them to make photocopies. <laughs> and they want to go meet a congressman or woman or a senator, woo, woo, woo. And I say, look, it's not that big a deal. Uh, and that's why I emphasize this view of calling because it's, it's so important that people get stirred for the right reasons and not sort of some melodramatic uh, reason of I want to be the next uh, Lord Shaftesbury or William Wilberforce, uh, but instead I want to be faithful in my calling. And by the way, could I just say, I and mean, you all know uh, William Wilberforce is the important British parliamentarian who was a Christian who literally worked for 23 years to abolish the slave trade. And what I like to remind people about Wilberforce's example is when I've asked biographers of Wilberforce, did Wilberforce know he was Wilberforce? Did he know that 100 years later we'd be making movies about him? Did he know that biographers would be written? And they all say no. He had no clue. He was being a faithful Christian in Parliament and he saw the oppression of the slave trade and he worked for it. He had no idea that he'd be a hero. And so often right now we may have somebody in this state, at this school, who could be the next Wilberforce, but you don't know. You have to be faithful in your calling and see what God does. Uh, Matt, that's a long answer to a question I have no answer to, and so that's why I gave a rambling answer. <laughs> Did that get at it some of it? I'm sorry, I don't have a list. Anybody else? Uh, yes, sir, over here. Uh, you talked about... Uh, Say your name. Uh, Andrew Cleary. Uh, Thank you, Andrew. Finding uh, prudence, practicality, balance, Yes, yes. Uh, Andrew asked an important question about finding a balance uh, and being a prudent person where your your well, let me just quickly say your prudence is rooted in solid theological and biblical presuppositions and convictions and a worldview about the world. That's what your framework is. That being said, then you find yourself confronting situations where the text does not lead to the falling position. And so in between what the Old Testament book of Amos says about justice rolling down waters and about a certain policy on Capitol Hill, there's not a direct line. And there are people on the right and left who do this all the time. What it says in Amos this, this will mean that therefore this fallen welfare policy ought to be spent no matter how much money it costs. And there's what are called middle level axioms that you've got to work through, and that's called prudential reasoning. 
finding where, how we get to there. Now, a recent example of this uh, is uh, about four or five months ago, President Obama was in this, I mean, I found myself, and I'm not a fan of the president currently, uh, nor have I been, uh, nor will I be. Uh, <laughs> But I had real empathy and sympathy for the President of the United States because he was getting daily reports of s genocide occurring in Syria. And he went on national TV to try to convince not just the American people, but left-wing Democrats, I'm about to bomb Syria. And they, why, well, you sound like George W. Bush. But I happen to know that he was getting reports that there was people were being slaughtered. And so he was a trying to persuade the American people that if we don't do this, this is gonna keep it, and we've warned them. Well, you know, he pulled back because the pressure was so great. Now, prudential calculations were going on because you have two very bad choices. We hear that people are being slaughtered in Syria and we, have, we should, as America, do something about it. On the other side, you had people said, we're already involved in Iraq, we're involved uh, around the globe, and we could be involved in Iran. Why, we're involved in Afghanistan, and now you wanna go, you're the president, wanna get us out of Afghanistan and out of Iraq, and you wanna to go to Syria. And so he had huge pressure to don't do it. And yet at the same time, he had pressure that says, you're standing by while people are being slaughtered. Well, uh, he didn't do it. And the commentators I respect the most say that that was probably the best of two very bad choices. But there's a situation where prudence had to play a role and he's looking at advisors and military officers said, some who said, do it going, and he even said it, we're gonna go in quick, we're gonna do it, and we're gonna leave. And the military advisor said, no you're not, you can't leave. And I'm telling you all this to say, there's an example where prudence was at play. And you didn't have to be a conservative, look, on that issue, conservatives disagreed with the conservatives and liberals disagreed with liberals, and the president was standing right in the middle and saying, I'm not a wartime president, and I'm standing by why genocide occurs. He felt tormented about it, and it was one of the times I had sympathy for the position of why our president's hair always becomes gray while they're in office. Does that help you at all, uh, a little there, Andrew? I mean, that, that's just an example of, you know, how do we get from A to B and the choices are not great. Plus, it also gave me an opportunity to make a bipartisan statement of great sympathy for the man who is the President of the United States, by the way, who we should pray for at all times. Okay. I feel another hand coming up, and here it comes. Um, so you talked about Christians being the moral minority in America. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So what about with social issues in mm -hmm. terms of what we believe America should do in terms of our beliefs that are yep. different from the stories? Being, like be, yeah, yeah, be, let me just quickly say, being a moral minority doesn't mean you don't do anything. It's just right. being uh, aware of the reality that when the Christian right came into existence in the late 70s, their whole appeal was, we are the moral majority that's not being represented, and the numbers are with us, and most everybody agrees with us, and they helped Reagan have a landslide because of rallying heretofore non-registered fundamentalist voters to vote. And, uh, and now what's really evident from all the polling data is that the moral majority doesn't exist anymore on gay marriage, on any number of social issues. That being said, doesn't mean, oh, we're the moral majority, go ahead and let it go. No, it means we're a creative moral majority, it's gonna do everything we can, but by the way, it doesn't take large numbers to create a culture shift. One of the reasons for the great popularity and best-selling book called Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell is that Gladwell shows it only takes about a dozen people to create a tipping point. But when it gets momentum, it changes. Oh, okay, I'll give you a counterexample. The move for gay marriage in this country, five years ago, could not be predicted where it is right now. I mean, I know some friends who are serious social commentators said they've never seen a cultural attitude and momentum shift in our culture about this issue in like two or three years time. 
Well, if it did, it might well shift back with the right arguments being made. And so being a moral minority doesn't mean uh, we're about to get crushed. It means that we're not, we're not in the, lar the larger minority is not with us. We have to make our arguments more persuasive uh, and stronger and be faithful because minorities change history. Look at the Jewish population in this country. How many percentage of the Jewish population is represented in this history? And yet among our intellectual elites, they're right across the top and their arguments persuade all kinds of people. So you don't have to have the numbers to change things. So please don't understand when I said we're the moral majority that we are now, it's over. And by the way, I make the point about Irving Kristol saying the culture war is over. I just make that to say that uh, People who seem to be surprised oftentimes about the state of America, you want to say, well, where have you been the last 30 years? I mean, have you not noticed? The movies that people love, they're not really that good. <laughs> they're like wicked. Slasher movies are best sell. I mean, come on. We live in a really difficult time. Uh, and I have to say that because at Biola University, you may not know that it's like that out there, but leave the campus, you know it pretty quickly. Well, all you can do is turn on your computer. What am I talking about? The internet. But uh, anyway, moral minority creates a potential and a challenge that might well create new, well, what did you say, Matt? At dinner. I got a great quote from you. I'm gonna use it as a, oh, moment a moment of clarity from one of your professors. This all could create a moment of clarity for all of us. Uh, and a time for really uh, thinking ways to be more persuasive. Yeah. And you can follow up too, you know my email. If you forgot my email, your sister can give it to you. Her sister works in our office. Anybody else? I know you're dying to go to dessert, but uh, this gentleman here wants to keep us just a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. some extent, I would like for you to define that statement a little more. But I, I asked it because you moved right into a discussion of natural law after that. Um, uh -huh. And in regard to natural law, where it's that's something that's written on the heart, um, yeah. something that we all would have in common, not a lot of ambiguity happening yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, what do we do when our natural law moves beyond murder, recognizing murder and yeah. cowardice into... That's very helpful. Tell me your name. Derek. Another Derek? Derek and Andrews are all throughout the other places. Uh, uh, Derek, um, actually now that you mentioned it, I think I am going to, the next time I give this talk is reverse the numbers and go natural law then prudence. And somebody can say, why did you go natural law instead of prudence? And I'll say, because Derek suggested. <laughs> but no, you're, you're right. Derek, let me just quickly say, when I use the word ambiguity, I didn't mean something was clear. I, I, what I mean to say is to people that when things are ambiguous, don't be surprised when they are ambigu amb ambiguous, like the Syrian question. A lot of things come up where the choices are Whoa, let's see, I have a biblical worldview. This ought to sort of take care of this. No, it doesn't, not always. There's ambiguity there. There are a lot of questions in our life that are like, oh, these options are not the ones I want. Well, those are the ones you have. Yeah, but I want this one over here. By the way, there are people in the Christian political philosophy community who do this all the time. They describe a universe that's not on a ballot anywhere. And you say, that's helpful, Where, how do I go vote for that? <laughs> and you wanna say that these are the choices. By the way, this happens a lot among Republicans. Well, I don't like Romney. I don't like McCain. Yeah, well, what's your option? And this goes on. Now I'm seeing it on Facebook all the time. You rhinos out there, Republicans in name only, keep giving us these candidates that keep getting slaughtered. Oh boy, I could get going on this. <laughs> a lot of what I had to say about prudence is rooted in this sort of ideological trap of people on the, it happens on the left, but I see it now more on the right where people are, friends of mine who teach at Hillsdale College, I almost, have, by the way, have learned a lesson as you already know, having been experienced on Facebook that some of us are not, you know, jump in the queue and add something. Oh no, I got ready to do this to a friend of mine who teaches history and political science and theology at Hillsdale College who's just a right-wing nut. And uh, 
Hey, you rhinos in Washington, all you keep giving us is, you know, well, you know, okay, I think you want to go with Mr. Paul and let us lose by a landslide. <laughs> and so I, he's a person I want to talk to seriously someday about prudence. Because you keep wanting to put forward these ideological pure candidates who can win 2% of the vote. And uh, they don't like ambiguity. And I want to say ambiguity is a part of life because we live in a fallen world. Got an amen on that? Yeah. Amen. Oh, good. I think I got an amen because some people want to go to dessert. <laughs> but Derek, right? Derek, thank you. That's what I mean by that. And I promise you, I'm serious, I'm going to flip my categories and go to natural law, then prudence, because prudence flows out of natural law. And it took somebody sitting on the front row at Bio University to show me that. Thank you, Derek. Thank you all for listening so patiently to this obscure, abstract political message from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.